Welcome to the Always On Podcast. I'm very excited to be joined by a gentleman who requires virtually no introduction. Uh, probably the best known authority in practice management in the financial services industry, co-author of the Advisor Playbook, heads up the practice management department for arguably the most advisor-centric firm in the industry, and I'm referring, of course, to First Trust Portfolios. Chris Jepson, thanks for making some time. How are you doing? I'm feeling good, enjoying a little of this uh, sunny weather here in Cabo San Lucas. Uh, anytime, though, I can get on the Always On podcast with my good friend, Duncan McPherson's a good day. So happy to be here, happy to share some of the findings that we're having on this topic today. So it's going to be fun. Yeah, I've got a little bit of a backdrop envy there. That's not green screen, right? <laughs> no, I poked my finger on that. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. So, uh, yeah, thank you. We're going to talk about uh, an emerging theme that is gathering steam uh, on becoming a multifamily office. And we're going to cover uh, a spectrum of options and approaches, but ultimately how to convert uh, a financial professional's momentum after many years into uh, the force multipliers of growth. Uh, and again, on becoming a multifamily office. Now, you made a great suggestion when we had our pre-call to frame all of this in the acronym SNIB. Okay, so subject, need, ideas, and benefits. And uh, it just reminded me how gr much of a great premise that is for uh creating uh, a content that's going to be of interest to an audience. So can we just start with your insight on SNB? It's what I've always used uh, when it comes to creating presentations. If you're going to be meeting with clients, if you're going to be speaking to a team in order to give any kind of conversation without a framework, right? Can easily go off into a rambling with no end in sight. And then people are like, I'm just around someone that just likes to talk about talking about things. SNB really, I think, hones in what the purpose of the meeting is about, getting clear on the purpose and benefit to all involved. And so I use SNB, S-N-I-B, when planning a talk, uh, proposals, whatever. And it begins with the subject. And our subject today is this multifamily office trend. And single family office for those that, that do the all buy in. And then what is the need? And we talk about what's needed in order to implement something like that, whether that's the, the environment, the, the economics around that. And then the idea, we'll share some ideas, pros and, and cons on implementing that. And then the benefit to, the, to those that are listening. So I would encourage everybody when, when creating any kind of content or presentation, I, got, I can't even remember, but it isn't mine. Uh, like most things, I didn't create it. It was probably, I think it was a training that I set in 25 years ago above the Rosebud Restaurant in downtown Chicago, Illinois, is where I heard that now that I think about it. So it stuck with me that long and served me well. So I like well, it. And it, it. You know, in between that pre-call and today, uh, it served me very well, again, for laying out the notes and just making sure it's it's in a cogent uh, form. What's really interesting about the subject, which is arguably the hook, is uh, in the last couple of weeks, I've had many intense calls with very uh, high caliber teams about the concept of becoming a multifamily office. And part of the uh, uh, approach is to approach, you know, approach it as a progression. It doesn't have to be something that you jump in 100% all in. You can test the waters and there's many benefits to that. One of them is on the merit of growing down to grow up market. And uh, on that point, it, what's interesting is I spoke to a very substantial team. Uh, there's a, another comma in the amount of money they manage. It's quite meaningful. But we talked about the mindset. And I said to him, I said, you, you as the leader of the team have to keep thinking like an advisor that manages $50 million clients, not $5 million clients. That's where you came from. But now this is where you're going. And that has provoked 
some very great exchanges with uh, teams like that. It's the same experience that you're having. And I think it, it has to do with this mass liquidation, which we'll speak a little to that's occurring in, in the markets and M&A activity and the like. But there, there is an opportunity. And I rarely see on, on the single family office side, that's typically is a, a kind of a one and done thing where someone will reach out, hire an individual and, and that's their sole focus. But where most of our conversation will go today is more of that gradual evolving multifamily office, that MFO one where they're just finding themselves, typically the most senior member of the team is finding them, they're themselves spending most of their time with just a very select few clients and delivering an experience that is so impressive that it's it's contagious on the introduction side. So that's it's a trend that I thought it might have been a one off a couple of years ago, but there's too many recurrences of of teams that have created this brand within a brand uh, of um, MFO. Right. And and on the far end of the spectrum, that that CFO, that complete family office, <clears throat> I first was introduced to that. I read the book, The Road Ahead by um, Mr. Bill Gates. And it was the first time I realized that um, his financial advisor at that time, I guess, had one client and it was Bill Gates. And I thought, wow, that's kind of an interesting concept. I never thought of that. But again, the far extreme, you come back into uh, a sort of a, a more general sense, but you, you made a point there and we'll just pivot to the need Demographic forces, those liquidity events, and other issues are driving so much money in motion and uh, exposing unmet needs and creating opportunities for financial professionals to reimagine growth, while at the same time, self-actualizing personally and professionally. And that's a big piece of this in the spirit of plateau avoidance. So you think about the need, there is a... And, and, even in the last two years, I mean, here we're approaching 2022. In the last two years, the segment of high net worth clients who want the complete picture and a turnkey solution headed up by that proverbial quarterback, rather than all these individual pieces being cobbled together and all these moving parts, it's created this need. And, you know, we've talked about this several times. The tipping point for many that nudged them to take action was when they themselves had a long-term client who was a great client, sort of over many years became a $5 million client, and then the liquidity event, and then they became a $50 million client because of the sale of the business, whatever the case may be. And it prompted that client to feel that they had outgrown that advisor and they moved on. And that nudged the advisor to say, okay, I've got to step it up. And I know you've seen that uh, several times as well. There can't be a worse feeling. And I'll tell you, I, I dread the phone call where we get connected with someone, maybe through a wholesaler who's had a, and it's always after the fact, right? Hey, I've got an advisor who's just lost one of their potentially largest clients now, and they, they'd love to talk to you. Well, great. You know, after the heart attacks, always a great time to talk about health habits, right? So why not be a little more forward looking and be able to anticipate that what we're experiencing today in the area of, of wealth management and planning is evolving and it's happening quickly. And to put our head in the sand and think that the future is not going to involve more tech laden, algorithmic asset allocation models that are tailored real time to the client's evolving needs. And that will be your differentiator is going to be a very difficult space to live in. And so it's almost the need is to foresee the anticipated need of where real wealth is going to be. And it's going to be beyond an asset allocation model. And that's why these MFOs are just really, I think, meeting what it is that people have wanted all along someone that can simplify their lives. They are looking as complexity 
is the silent killer of happiness. It's growingly complex lives. And the more money they have, the more complex their life becomes. I'll tell you a funny story. I probably shouldn't use their name, but we had a little Christmas party this last Sunday, a little church Christmas deal. And a bunch of people from the congregation got together. And there's a guy in the congregation who is, uh, whose net worth is, uh, exceeds $10 billion. Okay. And he's kind of sitting off on his own. And, and, uh, and I knew this podcast was coming up and I thought, boy, this'd be a good opportunity to ask him about his family office. But I didn't, it wasn't the time to do that kind of thing. But he was kind of just doing his own thing on his phone, not really interacting with anybody. And, and I'm like, boy, he's probably involved with some pretty heavy duty stuff right now. I mean, he's got museums named after him, right? So this is, this is uh, one of those guys. So I go walking by and I kind of peek over his shoulder to see what he's working on. He's playing solitaire on his phone. I'm like, during the Christmas party, this guy sitting back here playing solitaire. Now I really got to talk to him about who's running his money because this guy is completely at ease with everything being taken care of. And I think that's what we do is with an MFO, we answer the questions that the wealthy don't even know they should be asking and provide them the ability to play solitaire when they want. I mean, that's, that's what this guy was doing. And those that anticipate this trend, I believe, will be positioned, at least this is what we're seeing over the last couple of years, they're positioned to hoard a large amount, a corner of, of the wealth that's out there. So just a, anecdotally. I thought for sure when you said $10 billion, it was going to be one of those, uh, I'm asking for a friend kind of things, but no. Yeah. Okay. So it's a, actually a real person uh, in your community. That's funny. Um, but that's a very powerful statement. Uh, around what a financial professional's value does is put someone at ease, at ease enough with all of the complexities in his life to play solitaire in an event like that. That's pretty powerful. Now, here's the thing. Uh, it's easy to get excited about an opportunity. Happy high notes, right? All optimism. Let's do it full throttle. But uh, speaking of tech, uh, one of my favorite books of all time was uh, Andy Grove's book, Only the Paranoid Survive. Rich, you have to balance optimism, ambition, and positive thinking uh, with the fact that there's sometimes a very positive power that comes from negative thinking, looking at the other side. So let's, let's talk about some ideas, but let's first talk in terms of maybe this isn't a good idea for everybody to consider even gradually easing into a multifamily office. So let's talk about three tough questions that a financial professional should ask themselves first to assess the opportunity. So number one, and I want your commentary on this too, are you prepared for a more demanding client with massive responsibilities? It is. It is such an important question. I love that we're addressing this first because before taking on any new initiative, it's always best to go in with your eyes open. And we don't want to encourage people one way or the other, just to give you the, the, all the information and then allow you make an, an informed decision. You know, one of my, my favorite uh, coaches on the Peloton, that's how he starts every workout. He says, over the next 45 minutes, I'm going to make suggestions and then you're going to make decisions. And that's what this is. We're going to make some suggestions and then you can make the decisions. One of those suggestions is go in it with your eyes open here. Be aware that this is exactly what you allow it to become. If, if you want someone to be able to call you real life example again, because one of their pilots on their jet just took another position and that now position has to be filled, who's going to handle that? They don't want to handle it. Do you want them calling you on that? You do the vetting, identifying, interviewing, then bring them two or three qualified candidates. That's a real life example of what a family office has gone through that I've witnessed occur. Also, uh, it's not just those, those small things. It's, the, it's that artwork that's uh, at the fourth home 
that they're looking to get a loan on that has to be appraised internationally, taking on an exchange rate risk, all these things, it can be pretty involved. Just be clear on the ground rules that you'd like to set going into it. It's almost like, are you the property manager of their third home? Do you want to be the person who's finding out like who's going to take care of the, the, you know, the damage that had occurred through the last hurricane on their, on their property? I, it, it is something to be aware of. It's a slippery slope on responsibilities and to-do list items. If you become that, that all go-to type type office. And it could be just the minutia of, oh, my fourth home in Miami, I forgot to pay the property taxes. And uh, now the city takes crypto. So can we work that out? I mean, yeah, so many moving parts that has to be process driven through bench strength, impeccable best practices, and a well thought out panoramic and all encompassing process. So yeah, that's number one. And then a perfect segue to the second question, are you prepared to forfeit the safety net of a large, diverse client base? Now, what's interesting, the enlightened professional would say, hey, my safety net, I've got 300 clients, it's been terrific, but it's a bit of a hammock now. I'm kind of in a mode of complacency and I'm trying to achieve that plateau avoidance. I wanna find that next gear, personally and professionally. Right, the best version of myself. And to do that, I've got to play at that next level. So no disrespect to the 300, but my top 50 clients bring something out in me. But again, it's 50 clients, it's 25 clients, it's no longer 300. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, it's the idea of being over-concentrated versus being diversified versus being diluted, right? Where, where is, does dilution occur? Where is to concentrate to concentrate. Uh, one, one advisor I know offhand is a billion plus assets with 23 relationships. And I was like, we're always talking about streamlining. And so I'm always talking about reducing the number of households and holdings, create more capacity by reducing workload. We have those conversations all the time. But I can remember when I first met him, he had 17 clients and was running about 750 million at the time. And, uh, I was like, wow, that's fantastic. I go, 17, I've never seen anybody so focused. And this was back before MFOs were, were gaining popularity. This was probably 10 years ago. And, and he says, well, he goes, yeah, it's nice. Unless you lose one. <laughs> and that was when it got real. I'm like, yeah, I guess that could be bad. And so going into it with your eyes open again, there is a safety net there. But the more enlightened professionals, I believe, are get past that one. It's just something I think that we have to acknowledge. Now, it's safe to say that that advisor you're speaking of, uh, 17 to 23, uh, professional scarcity is a big part of his value proposition when he meets with a prospective client? Well, no doubt. The uh, There's so many scarcity stories o- over the years that you and I have both heard that it's just true. People of affluence, they they want specialists, not generalists. They want to know that they are they are important to to who they're working with, and and those advisors they leverage that. I I can remember a different event where we actually had an ultra high net worth individual come and speak to some advisors, hmm. and one of the advisors asked, and there's maybe a group of twenty five, and it was at a a racing a car racing event. I can remember that was actually a fun event, and the. Uh, one of the advisors said, I just have a question for you. What was a question that you asked advisors when you were interviewing them before the sale of your business on, on who you would go with? Did you ever ask a question and based on their answer, eliminate them immediately from uh, being a potential advisor for you? He says, oh, yeah. I, and I was curious what it was, too. He goes, we asked all of them how many clients they had. And if the answer was over 35, it wasn't going to be a good fit. Everyone in the room. Now you got to keep in mind, these were really good advisors, but there wasn't one in the room that didn't have more than 35 clients should have seen some faces. And that's that kind of that reason for having this conversation. Now, don't 
allow those people to feel they've outgrown you. A brand within the brand allows you to have that 35, maybe still maintaining the others as more of a, a, a figurehead to the team on the rest of the practice. So that, I'll, I won't forget the reaction of the advisors hearing that answer to that question. Well, I'm going to come back to that because there's an advisor in the Northeast that you and I know very well who uh, loves racing. And uh, he's found that sweet spot where he's got professional scarcity on one side and depth and breadth on the other side, just because he's so process driven. But I'll come back to that in a second, because there's a couple of things that I didn't really fully understand until I started talking to top advisors in between our pre-call and this call today which were incredible. And it's it's framed around this third question. Are you prepared for the minefields around the dynastic forces, especially for the suddenly affluent? Those are the people that go from five to 50 or more. And one advisor specifically uh, started to see a pattern emerge. And part of it did come out of this last, uh, the episode of the last couple of years here, is that he is starting as a value-added service to his clients to put a massive emphasis on psychological support, uh, stress relief, mental health. He's bringing in psychologists uh, to do webinars. He wants to do live events next year where he's going to talk about the anticlimax, among other things, the anticlimax of of hitting your number and becoming financially independent, planting the flag on the summit, so to speak, and saying, okay, now what? What do I do with the rest of my life? I mean, my life's work is behind me. I thought I wanted to retire and I love playing golf. I love doing this, that, and the other thing, but I feel a void. And that can start to erode someone's mindset, their pursuit of self-actualization, And then you have the emotional impact on the suddenly affluent as it relates to the family tree. Uh, Kids, you know, the sandwich aging parents, the whole dynamic. That is the X factor. That is the value added service that the enlightened advisor is getting out in front of and addressing on the topic of complexities. As you know, I'm doing a podcast with Jackie Wilkie, who's a pretty important part of your bench strength that, uh, the practice management department at First Trust, and uh, she is a saying that more money, more problem, more money, more problems, right? Which is interesting. Um, but I, I want to give you an example because uh, you remember way back when you were telling me about your personal interviews with dad, right? That you would do with your kids. Uh, I think you said annually, um, just to sort of supplement all your parental guidance. But what's interesting is I know advisors, part of their process is to talk to their clients' kids on a regular basis. And and that's personal interviews with dad's advisor. And uh, especially for that client family that's tracking towards the inflection point. I mean, I know advisors that say to their clients, you know, this is non-optional. Part of my process is to know where this money is going and know that it's going to be in good hands and that that next generation is well prepared because I've seen some horrific outcomes with that. And there's a a fear factor to the way they position it, but it's very, very strong. And clients embrace it and they do it in the form of a Zoom meeting. But, you know, they go back to some of the old chestnuts. Like remember the old saying that, if your outflow exceeds your income, your upkeep will be your downfall. Yeah. I mean, that's just 101 stuff that we heard 30 years ago. But he talks about understanding burn rate, income, debt service, and how uh, there have been people that have absorbed a lot of money. And after the shopping spree, uh, it fell apart like a cheap tent. So that's a very interesting dynamic around dynastic and family investment legacy issues is the advisor, the financial professional and their team, just wrapping the, the, the family into the process and, you know, just showing those intentions that, Hey, um, 
legacy matters. So that that's part of your, uh, you inspired that way back when. I'm not sure if you knew that. Well, the personal interviews with dad are, I'd like to say it wasn't quite as anal as, uh, but it kind of was. It was, it was the first Sunday of every month, actually, that we did it. So I don't think you need to do those with dad's advisor every month. Once a year is actually a, a good number on that. But those were just great times of, and we talked about everything about, hey, how are you helping out mom around the house, treating your brother and sister, sports goals, then later dating and, and so many issues. And it actually, at their graduation, we compiled all of those notes and gave it to them as a, as a gift. So nice. turns out being a nice little, little family history when it's all put together that idea of doing it with the advisor annually is, is a great deal. Just with our kids, it was a turned out being a great little family history. So it, it goes to that whole idea of building trust again, communications, that component of it, right? Consistency in that communication and, and having the client feel like you're vested in their interest of what is to become with this legacy that they're leaving behind. It's, it's value add all across the table in a, best practice. Northern Trust does a really good job of those, those, uh, those conversations with second and third generation inheritors. One of the best things my wife has done with my kids is instill for them a sense of frugality. And like, they're not, they, they've got money, but they're not walking around going, how many colors does it come in? Can I get a volume disc? I mean, they're just, and my oldest son, especially, he was with us in the car coming down from the ski hill. And, you know, we're of Scottish descent. And I've always been joking with him that, uh, you know, you're the classic Scotman, Scotsman in that you've got deep pockets, but short arms. Like to get you to spare with a dollar is an event. Like opening that wallet, you hear the creak, you see the moth fly away. There's dust and it's just so funny, but I, I actually admire it because he's not ever looking to spend his money, oh. but yet he's living a good life. So I, I really do admire that. That's fantastic. No, I love that. That's a great attribute. In fact, uh, just one of my, one of my most recent reads, a really good read. And I was talking to you about this before as well is entitled mania. Mm -hmm. If, uh, if those that are listening, haven't read that it's a great compilation of a of a consultant to some of America's uh, really the world's wealthiest families and what happens with that second and third generation wealth and how some of the psychological aspects uh, from the consulting side of how he handled that with clients, I think is addressed beautifully in that book entitled mania. What's great about that book is it's not just uh, how to not create entitlement with your kids, but also if you feel like maybe that ship has sailed, how to undo it. It's actually very, very strong. I've had a really great conversation with my wife about that, being a stay-at-home mom who was basically at the beck and call of my kids for everything they did, sports, social activities, right? The whole thing. And the conversation we had that came out of that book in Title Mania was very, very powerful. And she agreed. She She wasn't being defensive or anything. And um, anyway, very, I highly recommend that. And, you know, it's funny, it's not uncommon that a first generation self-made affluent person will deprive their kids of the experiential learning that, that where grit is manufactured through dealing with and overcoming adversity. Well, one of the quotes I love from that book is in our effort to give our kids everything that we didn't have, we failed to give them everything we did have. And that was a lot of those, those struggles and trials and, and stumbling blocks. And as an advisor working with some of these affluent families, uh, I, I got that book from one of those, uh, one of those people that's part of a multifamily office. And it was given to them by one of their advisors. And it not as an insult, but hey, this is these are just case studies of families that have had experiences that where large amounts of wealth have been transferred. Be an interesting read for you. Well, and I said to a couple of advisors last week, you should read the book and then create an executive summary on your own perspective and then send that summary to your clients and say, this is what I got from this book. 
So it's not preachy. It's not a lecture. It's saying, I love this book. It spoke to me and uh, send that off. That's just a great little touch, a great little value add. And it's still showcasing the third party subject matter expert. So these are the ideas um, around value added services that clients will really find to be of value because they're often unmet needs. They're often uh, provocative, they're controversial. And so people avoid them. And, you know, it's interesting. I did a podcast with Tom Deans, who wrote a couple of books, bestsellers, and he does webinars on behalf of advisors, talking to business owners about why do you keep kicking the can down the road on your continuity succession and family investment legacy plan, especially as it relates to the sale of your business. Why do you keep putting that off? And it's a good cop, bad cop dynamic because he comes in with humor, but a lot of energy and basically says, you better get on this. And then he shines all the light on the advisor and says, if you want to take action on this, go talk to him or her. It's really, really powerful. But the whole premise here is expand your thinking, reimagine the value you bring being panoramically process driven around the unmet needs of the back half of their life not just achieving their financial goals. Now, let's pivot to the um, deeper dive on ideas. Again, I'll come back to the advisor in the Northeast that you know well. Um, we've been working with him for several years, massive fan of First Trust, of course. And we did a strategic planning session, and he has gone through this first element of the MFO uh, premise where he has built that brand within a brand, which means he is a deliverable for that high caliber, complex client, but he hasn't abandoned the rest of his business. He didn't disassociate none of that. He just built out his bench, deepened his process. But what's interesting in the strategic planning uh, session that we had is I asked him, I said, talk to me about Nirvana in the next three to five years. Uh, what does it look like if it all falls out of the sky into your lap? And he said, after a long give and take, he said, 40 and 40. And I said, okay, so write that down. What does it mean? And he said, I want to do $40 million in revenue. And I want to race on 40, no, 40 days a year on the racetrack. Now, what's interesting is in our lot since that time, we spoke again just last week about this and many other things. It's evolved now from 40 and 40 to 60 and 60. His brand within the brand is catching so much traction, and yet he's still managing. So if you think of Pareto, 80-20, okay, so the 80% of the business is process-driven. The 20% of the business is process-driven, and now there's 80-20 on the 20. He keeps going further up market. So I'd love some insights from you on the brand within the brand, which in essence basically means take your top 25 clients, elevate their client experience bumper to bumper, and still ensure that it's not coming at the expense of the rest of your business. Any thoughts on that would be great. You know, I just listening to you describe that, I just, all I could do is just echo the the only thing that I would add was, or would be that for that particular advisor that you're speaking to, and for all those that have gone through those similar experiences, the added benefit of self-actualization, of really believing uh, and, and, and feeling that self-fulfillment that goes beyond just the free time to pursue hobbies and interests, but to be able to have a more meaningful impact and really on the world is is what they're mm -hmm. feeling on families that have impacted the world some of them in really big ways that they they feel that they're they have a role in that and it's it, it's pretty awesome it's not work i mean that's one thing that you witness right away when you see them they they like their clients could have retired <laughs> long ago but yeah. they continue to do it because it's it's not work it's it's a calling is what it built well, self-made professionals, self-made affluence will always retain a pride in productivity. They, they, they never say to themselves, I have to do this. I get to do this, right? It's very fulfilling and rewarding. I mean, 
this is not work for me. I enjoy this. I get as much out of it. Every consultation I have. Um, are there hiccups and speed bumps and friction? Of course. But what that reveals is part of the self-actualization pursuit. But I do, uh, I, I want to come back to the examples of, of some of the advisors who have done this properly. They put their toe in the water, they've eased in, and it started progressing. So they embraced automate, which means they embrace technology whenever possible. Allocate, which means they outsourced as much as they possibly could, especially things that were commoditized. Delegate, which means they empowered their team through organization and structure. And then finally, in some cases, disassociate. Disassociate from certain clients that are not a good fit to the point where you, and I, I got this from you many years ago, to the point where you feel you're doing a client a disservice by keeping them. Because it's just so disconnected. It's just not a good fit. It's not about revenue hitting numbers. It's just, it's just not a good fit. It hurts more than it helps. So that is a big premise. Automate, allocate, delegate, and disassociate if necessary in, in adding the brand within a brand. You got a thought would, on that? I would just to follow up on that, if this is something that is resonating as you're listening to this, that you know what? What does that, how do we actually put that into practice, this automation? Uh, to what technology are you speaking? Are we talking copy talk? Are we talking about uh, outsourcing to outside money managers? When you talk about s- streamlining, right? Allocating, delegating, are we delegating households? Have we delegated the activity of, of reducing the number of holdings that we're following? Mm-hmm. So all of these activities We've, we've got the process cracked on that. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. That is contact uh, First Trust partner or reach out to Pareto Systems. They'll put you in contact as well and, and guide you through this process of, look, worst case scenario, you become a more streamlined, efficient, well-oiled machine that produces and creates additional time for you to pursue whatever passion and interest that you want. If that passion and interest is to grow this segment of higher net worth individuals to create the brand within a brand, then great. If not, it will, it will create a client experience that's more referable than the one that exists today. So there's the benefits are multifold, multifaceted. Yeah, your 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 wholesalers are are ninja level on understanding those dynamics. But back to the spectrum. So our friend in the Northeast, our sixty and sixty advisor, he's he's on one side of the spectrum where he has professionalized his models to such an extent, he's created multiple income streams where he is actually monetizing on his models because other advisors are adopting it. That's on one side. Then on the other side, on a more simplistic side. To your point, you see advisors who are effectively getting out of the wealth management business. Okay, they're taking the time where they usually got bogged down in the minutia and just outsource that to someone who had scale, which actually amplifies the advisor's fee worthiness because the less time they spend on what's commoditized, the more time they can invest into what's proprietary, their business, their enterprise value, their client experience, and their process. Now, that is counterintuitive, and I'm just going to... um, sort of borrow from Brian Westbury, because I love his saying, right? The antidote to conventional wisdom. When I hear conventional wisdom, to me, that's sort of like jumbo shrimp, right? It's just the the words don't work together. Uh, There is an antidote to what the masses do, to what we assume is are, are the accepted norms. We're talking about an antidote to conventional wisdom when it comes to growth, as a financial professional. Would you agree? Totally. This is, it, it's an antidote and it can be counterintuitive as yeah. well. Yeah. And that's what that whole, that law of scarcity is one of those examples. Yeah, well said. Uh, I want to touch on just briefly before we get to benefits. Um, Brian Gallery is, uh, you know, s- special forces level when it comes to engaging strategic partners. One of the most powerful ideas that I've seen to sort of build on what Brian has is the advisors who are now in the world of 
of brand within a brand or all in with MFO, 25 clients, the multifamily office, is they have fully professionalized the value added support team, which means they don't refer a client out to anybody. They engage everybody into the advisor's process. Okay, so value added support team uh, is an acronym, VAST, right? VAST. So you take a VAST approach to what value added means. And that is profound. So again, I know Brian, I mean, he's process driven. He has a very powerful philosophy. It's not about approaching an accountant and say, hey, I'll refer business to you. You refer business to me and we'll activate reciprocity. It's so client centric. Uh, there's another level of that when it comes to being that MFO advisor, correct? I don't believe that, uh, that these are independent of each other. I don't know of an example of someone running an MFO, a multifamily office that is not highly engaged with the outside professionals of that family, the CPA and the attorneys and the like. And so if you haven't adopted that first trust resource, Brian Galleries, not to mention the, the introductions will come from those resources that will be one of those 25. It just, that's where those, those happen. So uh, that is an absolute must to access that resource. If it's something that you're, you're committed to, to diving deeper into. Yeah, well said. And that's a perfect um, bridge to the benefits in SNB. So let's just spend a couple of minutes on this before we wrap up. I mean, there's self-evident, right? Fee worthiness of a specialist. You never have to sharpen your pencil. You never have to negotiate your value. Uh, you can establish a floor at, at a minimum in terms of your fees and don't negotiate that. And if somebody doesn't see the merit, then it's just not a good fit. And again, part of the professional scarcity and professional contrast. To your point a moment ago, uh, the automatic sifting in terms of the quality of advocacy that that advisor is seeing both from clients and because clients want to um, share that with the right people, but also strategic partners want to share that with the right people. So uh, just give you a second to, to add to that if you feel like it. Was it you that was sharing the example with me of the, the, the MFO team? They were at 1% and they were unapologetic about it. They were very clear with there is no discount and there's no additional fees. It's 1%. Was that, were you telling that story? Well, and you know where that came from? That came was that from- Dal that, Was that our Dallas guys? Yeah, but that was Dallas. an extension of the conversation of the advisor who was down to 35, right. trying to go to 70 uh, basis points. And, and the conversation with him because of his transition and evolution, and then just having the conviction, right? It's not, we're not defending our fees. We're not trying to convince you that this is fair. This is- our value, and this is how we're compensated. We're forthright, we're transparent, and we do not pretend that it's for everybody, but it's non-negotiable, right? So the conviction is, is very, very powerful. The conviction is, and then don't, don't forget, all of these folks are probably invested in pr the private equity space as well, and the hedge fund space. They know fees, and they're paying way bigger fees. The thing that I can't believe is what they pay for fees to sell a house. And how uninvolved <laughs> and unattached of an experience that is versus the value that you bring to the table. 1% is an absolute bargain if you're doing a fraction of what it is that we talk about to deliver on the client experience. So I would not be in any way apologetic for that. That's such know. a good point. Like it's, everything is as compared to what, right? 1% right. is compared to what? I mean, that's arguably too low, but well, that's nothing another. is good or bad, right? My favorite. One of my favorite quotes, nothing is good or bad except by comparison. And to compare your fee to another advisor is doing yourself a disservice because the vast majority of them are caught up in the idea of asset allocation models and, and portfolio performance and have just slipped down that slope of, of commoditization. And you're not in that space. I wouldn't compare yourself anywhere near that. Okay, absolutely. And just to wrap up the benefits, I mean, in the spirit of, okay, so you have the quantitative 
all of this contributes to incredible enterprise value, right? And every investment of effort an advisor makes in their evolution and their process-driven approach contributes to amplifying the enterprise value of their business. But on the qualitative side, and arguably just as, or probably even more importantly, is the best version of yourself. In any, you know, you golf, you play, you're very athletic, and undoubtedly you play with somebody who is very skilled. They will bring out something in you as you're playing as well. And and that law of environment and that impact and fulfillment on just getting to self-actualization, environment matters, right? Who we're around matters. I would just, uh, as we're adding on those benefits, just an idea came to me because we're approaching the end of the year and and gifts and cards and things like that are going out. I think we'd be remiss if we just didn't mention the quality of contact going into the end of the year. But on this MFO and uh, these 23, one of the families that I work with is they really they take this time to express gratitude to their clients mm-hmm. and they give them items that are, uh, while not really expensive, they're memorable and they leave a, a lasting impact. And some of those, I know, Duncan, that, that uh, you've got some contacts on that space, but I was just thinking about that because we're, we're in that season right now. We should probably mention that the, how important that personal touch is right now in the season. And it's not like you get to a point where your clients have outgrown their appreciation for the human touch because they're affluent. Okay. Again, so many people just sort of mail it in. They go through the motions with basic gifts that don't have that lasting impact or shelf life. And the deeper you go into a relationship, the more you place an emphasis on what matters to the client uh, based on form and other elements of chemistry. Uh, you can stop people in their tracks with a very tasteful, thoughtful gift. And you're right. It doesn't have to be expensive, but uh, gratitude and appreciation is a big fuel for aspiration and that pursuit of self-actualization. So, yeah, that's a very, very good point. Well, Chris, I know we only scratched the surface here, but in the um, uh, spirit of just time, Let's wrap it up. But as a call to action, you mentioned that if somebody listening in doesn't want to reinvent this wheel, they could start by reaching out to the First Trust Wholesaler and just ask them, hey, look, what are my options for stepping it up and raising the bar? Um, I don't. If you feel compelled to expand on that, by all means. You know, the 800 number, uh, 800-621-9533. And I would encourage them more than likely Uh, Everyone listening to the podcast probably has a copy of the advisor playbook, but at a minimum, a Kindle version or e-version of that, we'd be, we'd love to send to you. And uh, to dig a little bit deeper on this, uh, our partnership with Pareto Systems, I have to, I have to tell everybody listening, if you're a First Trust fan and you appreciate the culture being advisor centric, that's the reason why we have partnered in ways and, and do these podcasts together is the emphasis on the advisor and their success is genuine. And I appreciate our relationship, Duncan. So thank you for for having us on. Oh, right back at you. It's uh, absolutely um, a pleasure to work with a firm that, I mean, it's just not even close. There is no other firm in the industry that places as much importance on the financial advisor and that noble calling, but also just on, to your point, I mean, suggestions and decisions. I mean, the decision your firm made to say, okay, we're going to help advisors place as much emphasis on practice management and relationship management as they do on being world-class asset managers. That has obviously played out to be a game changer. So uh, very admirable. So as always, thank you for your time. Make sure you see us on LinkedIn because we're very active there. And uh, I, we do intend to go deeper into the multifamily office uh, storyline with case studies of financial professionals who have made that step and uh, made the decision to build that in as a brand within their brand or even beyond that. So Chris, have a great time. Good seeing you. And uh, thanks very much. Thank you guys. Beautiful.